Uh, we talk about it being a proclamation, how that we proclaim the Lord's death, how that we proclaim our faith in the, the efficacy of His blood, that, that uh, He did everything on the, on the cross that was necessary to appease the wrath of God, to make it possible for God in His holiness and in His justice to, to be able to forgive us of our sins. Uh, and we talked about how it was to be a communion with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And it's a participation in not only the death that He uh, suffered there on the cross, but a participation in His life, being a part of His body, the church, and sharing and having fellowship in that regard. This evening I want us to look at the Lord's Supper in a different fashion, and wouldn't you know it, but we're going to have that from you too. Why not? But this evening we, we want to look at the Lord's Supper from a different perspective, and that is, how should it be observed? Uh, we, we want to just look at some of the things that are within the text of the uh, text that was read just a moment ago by Brother Tommy. We talked about last week how that God seeks true worshipers to worship Him, and that we are to worship God because He is his spirit and that we need to worship him according to his nature. One of the things that Jesus said in the uh, in the passage of scripture that was written, uh, that was read just a moment ago, he, he revealed this to the apostle Paul. And one of the things that he said is that it is to be done in a worthy manner. Now what is said in the actual text is therefore whoever eats the bread or drinks of the, the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. If we can do it in an unworthy manner, then obviously we can do it in a worthy manner as well. I, I think that when Jesus said that we are not to partake of it in an unworthy manner, he wasn't really talking about us as far as us being worthy or unworthy to participate in this particular act of worship because as sinners we certainly all are unworthy. We're unworthy of the love of God. We're unworthy of the grace of God. So our worthiness is not what I think that Jesus had in mind here when he revealed this to the Apostle Paul. I think that what he is saying is that anyone who would partake of the Lord's Supper in an improper fashion, in a way that does not fit within the scope of what God has in mind and what Jesus had in mind when he instituted this memorial, uh, that uh, that would be a reason why uh, that God would be unpleased with us. Uh, we, we must do this in a proper fashion, according to what Jesus had in mind. When I was in school, uh, we call it middle school now, when I, was a, when I was in school, it was junior high school, but I remember when I was in the seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, along in those areas, uh, we had math classes, and, and we had what was at that time, at least, called statement problems. I hated those things. Uh, because if you had this problem where there was pieces of information given to you, you had to figure out what piece of information was, uh, was important to solving the problem, and then you had to solve the problem using the proper mathematical formulas. And I wasn't the best of students, and, and sometimes I didn't really study all that well. And when a test was given, uh, I could look at the problem, I could look at the information that was given there, and I could figure it out in my head, and I could come up with the right, with the right answer, and I would write the answer down on the test page. But when I got that back, a lot of times I had a fairly poor grade because even though I got the right answer, I didn't solve the, the problem in the proper fashion. Uh, the teacher a lot of times would write on there, show your work, you know, show how you did this. Uh, show me how that you understand the mathematical formulas that you're supposed to use in order to get this. I got the right answer, I just didn't get it the way that the teacher wanted me to get it. And she got, she counted the, 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 the answer wrong, even though I actually had the correct answer. That's just a matter of trying to help us get a handle on the fact that, that Jesus wants us to, to partake of this memorial in a very special way. Uh, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and he severely chastised them because they were partaking of it in an unworthy fashion, in an irreverent fashion. As we read about this morning, some would eat uh, and drink to excess, some would be drunk, some would be full, there would be some who got nothing 
because they had perverted the Lord's Supper to where it wasn't even an act of worship uh, as they were doing it there. We need to understand that God, that, that Jesus had instituted this memorial for us. He uh, gave it to us and he intends for us to, uh, to, to observe it in a very proper fashion, in, in a, a, an attitude of reverence and respect in regard to what God has done for us. Surely we can. We, we need to understand that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. Those, those words that he spake there on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken us? Uh, forsaken me? Surely we can, we can listen to those words of Christ and be pricked in our hearts and, and, and be caused to think about what an incredible sacrifice this is that he made for us, that he would have, be forsaken by the Father and that we would take just a few moments of our time during our worship assembly. You know, it is probably, what, about 10 minutes that it takes at the most uh, beginning to end uh, as far as the observance of the Lord's Supper. Those are 10 minutes that I believe that God wants us to, to sit quietly and, and, and reflect and to think on the things that we talked about this morning. Those are the time, that's the time that God wants us to really concentrate on the sacrifice that Jesus uh, made in our behalf. I kind of missed, to a certain extent, when we were still over at the, the Hessville Church, a small group there, and we had just about just enough men to serve in all the different ways uh, in the in the public assembly. So I got to I got to wait on the Lord's table quite frequently, and I really appreciated being able to do that. I think it's such an honor uh, and a privilege to be a part of that observance and to be one to serve others. Uh, the emblems. And one of the things that I noticed uh, was that while passing out the emblems, there would be a number of people, and I've noticed it here, I think I've been able to wait on the Lord's table a couple of three times, and uh, gratefully Nick has allowed me to wait on it this evening, and I appreciate that very much. Well, one of the things that I have noticed as I have passed the emblems is that there are people, some people, who will keep their hands bowed and, and I think probably are praying as they are observing this memorial, as they are thanking God for his great love and his mercy in giving his son Jesus. I know that some like to read either Isaiah chapter 53 or maybe one of the gospel accounts of Christ's crucifixion, or maybe even read here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, but they like to read from the scriptures about the sacrifice for Jesus. And I think that's a wonderful thing to do because it will help uh, uh, concentrate and to focus on that wonderful sacrifice. Uh, the fact of the matter is, all of us, as we observe this memorial, as Jesus wanted us to take time to sit quietly and to just think very carefully and very closely about this wonderful sacrifice that was made for us. And I think that that's what Jesus had in mind when he gave us this memorial in the first place, that we would take a, a measure of time and be still before our God and with reverence and respect think about the great love of God in sending His Son, Jesus. Because I believe that's the reason and the way that He intends for us to, to offer our act of worship there in the observance of the memorial. Secondly, I think that we need to recognize that Jesus also wanted us to examine ourselves as we are a, or as we are observing this memorial. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We are to observe this memorial with a great deal of self-examination. The scriptures have a lot to say about taking a real close, hard look at yourself. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, the Apostle Paul uh, encourage the brethren there at Carmen to examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. James in his epistle in James chapter 1 verses 23 through 25 talks about looking into God's mirror and looking into the perfect law of liberty and seeing ourselves what kind of person we are uh, as far as are we a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. We find also in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 how the, 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 the word of God is, is so powerful that it can help us to see within ourselves that it is a discerner of the, the, of the joints of the marrow, the thoughts of our very heart. We can see as we look into the scriptures of God's word. And so God has, 
has actually told us on, on a number of occasions that what he would like for us to do is to take a real close look at ourselves and to see what we see there and use his word as that reflecting mirror, if you will. Uh, I, some of you have noticed and commented, not, uh, maybe some of you have not, but since I have returned from Texas, I've lost 22 pounds and hopefully we we'll lose a lot more. And there's a number of reasons why I'm motivated once again to, uh, to lose some weight. But perhaps one of the most motivating factors is a picture that I have of myself. A picture that I have of myself from two years ago when my sister and I went to Greece. And when we were visiting one city, and by the way, for those of you who might not be aware of this, every city back in those days had what was called a necropolis. The, the necropolis was just the high point of the city. And that's where they would uh, erect this, uh, this great building. And every city had a necropolis. And I don't remember the city that we were in. It was not in Athens. We had already been to Athens and seen what most people think of when we talk about the Acropolis. We lived in another city, and the, the Acropolis, of course, is, as I said, is the high point of where that city is located. My sister and I, my sister had just gotten out of the hospital. I mean, she got out of the hospital the day before we left uh, to go on this trip to Greece. Uh, she, her heart was completely out of rhythm, and she was having all kinds of trouble with her heart, but the doctor released her and said it was okay for her to go, just be careful. Well, we got to this <laughs> we got to this town, and that was the promise, and everybody that was in our group was going to go up there, and Mary Jo and I looked at that and said, that really looks high, uh, you know? And so we decided that we weren't going to go up. It was a long way to walk up there. And somebody, somebody brought it to our attention, this, there's a fellow over here that's got some donkeys that you can ride up the trail and go up there. And at first, we didn't think that that was necessarily something we wanted to do, but the more we thought about it, the more we decided, okay, maybe that's not too bad. And it was really interesting because uh, I don't think that we normally think of donkeys as being all that intelligent. Well, let me tell you, this one was at any rate. He took one look at me and said, I don't want that fat guy. <laughs> get on to him so that I could ride him up. Someone took a picture of my sister and I and we were riding these donkeys going up to the accomplice and there it is. And as you look at that picture and you can see I'm as big as the donkey is. And if someone was going to put a caption on there, it probably be who should be riding whom? Because that's probably a pretty good question. Because literally I am, I'm as big as the animal was, and all the way up there, I kept telling Mary Jo, I really feel badly about riding this animal. I'm, I'm way too heavy. I shouldn't be on this animal. It was a steep grade and an uneven path that we were walking up trying to carry me. I am I'm confident that the animal rights people here in the United States would not have let me get on this animal. I think that they would have a weight restriction that wouldn't allow me to do that. But as I look at that picture, that picture tells me a couple of things. It tells me that I need to lose weight, but it tells me something even more important. It tells me that because I am that much overweight, in that area of my life, I'm out of control. That I haven't exercised the proper kind of control that I need to as far as watching my intake of food. And it tells me that I need to get my life better in control as far as eating properly and eating correctly as far as the, 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 the portions of food that I eat. It reminds me that also I need to keep my life, my spiritual life, in control as well. And I think that that's exactly what Jesus had in mind when he told us that he wanted us to let everyone examine himself as we observe this memorial. Because it's one of those things that we just need to do from time to time. One of the things that we need to do as we eat this bread and examine ourselves is to 
examine ourselves as far as our relationship with God. You remember there in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve had transgressed the will of God and he came walking in the cool of the evening, <coughs> in the cool of the evening and they tried to hide themselves from God and God asked them, where are you? Well, God knew where they were. He was just wanting them to take a look at where they were. God wanted Adam and Eve to pay attention to where they were in their relationship with Him. I think as Jesus gave Paul instruction concerning the proper observance of this memorial, this self-examination that He asks us to do would involve this very question, and that is, where am I in my relationship with God? Another question might be, does my life reflect Jesus living in me as it should? Where to be a light unto the world? The Apostle Paul wrote to the brethren of the churches of Galatia saying, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And I think that that's something that God would like all of us to, to reflect on. Not just as we observe this memorial, but perhaps especially during the observance of the Lord's Supper. Is my life really lived in service to God? Can I honestly say, for me to live is Christ? Because I believe that that is what God is asking us to press for, to try and to achieve. That we become living sacrifices unto Him willingly. So that our lives will reflect the life of Jesus who died for us. And that others seeing that then would have occasion to give God the glory. Also, I believe that we need to examine ourselves. I have willfully sinned and trampled underfoot this Son of God because we find that, that very phrase over in Hebrews chapter 6. How that those who sin willfully trample underfoot the Son of God. I don't think that I'm any different from anybody else. I think that I'm exactly like everybody else. And I can tell you, and ashamedly so, but there are times when I sin against God and I'm well aware of the fact that I'm sinning against God and I do it anyway. One of the things that Jesus wants us to do is as we're observing this remembrance of Him, to look deep within ourselves and say, am I allowing Satan to get that much a hold of me, that I would sin against God willfully. That being aware of what I was doing, I was, in, I, I was going to be sinning against God and I went ahead and did it anyway. You know, I think that we need to remember that Satan is such a powerful force. And he can and does from time to time get the better of us. That's the reason why the things that we talked about this morning are so important. Because it would be a, a, just an incredibly heavy burden to bear, wouldn't it? To know that I sinned, I sinned against God, and not just that I sinned against Him, but I did so willingly, purposely. I chose to do that. I knew ahead of time that it was a sin and did it anyway. What an incredible heavy burden that would be to bear if we could not get rid of the guiltiness of that. And this morning's lesson was uh, in, in, intended to help us to understand that we don't have to live with that kind of that the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that He came to save us from our sins so that our souls can be cleansed of our sins and that we can walk about before God confidently and we can approach His throne of grace confidently. And that we can approach Him as His children who have been cleansed of their sins, even the ones that we purposely committed. But the blood of Jesus Christ was given to us so that we can have the forgiveness of those sins. And Jesus wants us to examine ourselves and say, well, those are some things that I need to work on because clearly Satan is getting better of me from time to time. And I really need to shore up my strength in those areas. Have I truly repented of my sins? That, that uh, lesson that I talked about this morning, that last month, uh, one of the people who were in attendance to our fourth Thursday lecture, the piece of paper that he gave me, how can, how can we know if we're really forgiven. And we touched on that just very briefly. But as we talked about this morning, our confidence as far as forgiveness certainly is not shaken as far as Jesus' part. He did His part. By going to the cross of Calvary, giving us His blood on the cross of Calvary, we know that forgiveness is available to us. 
So if there's a question in our heart as to whether or not we've been forgiven, it comes from the fact, very likely, that we're questioning whether or not I truly have repented of this. Have I really decided in my heart that I don't want to do that anymore? Not only do I not want to do it, but it, it, it is despicable to me. It's, 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 a, it's such an offense to God that it's an offense to me. And as we examine ourselves, we can look at ourselves and see if any of these things are applicable. You know, the amazing thing about this memorial is it absolutely forces you to think about that, doesn't it? You, you cannot help but look within yourself as you are taking of those hymns. You cannot help but examine yourself and ask yourself, have I really repented? The sins that I committed this last week, are those things I'm really trying not to do anymore? And I think that that is such a marvelous, marvelous thing that God in His infinite wisdom and His Son Jesus Christ as well in His wisdom gave us this and instituted this memorial to observe knowing, knowing for a fact that you cannot observe that memorial properly without really looking within your heart and seeing what's there and calling upon yourself to try and do better and to be assured that God will help us in our efforts to try and withstand the temptations of Satan. And that when we stumble and fall, that he is right there to uphold us, to forgive us, because there is his son, Jesus Christ, sitting right at his side, asking God to forgive him, but to forgive us for his sake, because he died for us. And if God would not forgive us, if we are repenting, then Jesus would have gone to the cross for nothing. But for his sake, Father has promised that he will forgive us our sins. Remember those things against us no more. It's to be observed with other Christians. This is the part that I think that maybe sometimes we don't pay as much attention to. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another was the instruction. The fact of the matter is that God wants us to do this together. He wants us to take of these emblems together as one, as one in Christ, as God's spiritual family, as brothers and sisters in Christ. He wants us to remember and to demonstrate that we have a commitment that we're making of being unified and to, to live in peace and to help one another and bear one another's bur uh, burdens. It's, it's just another way that God has emphasized to us the importance of us gathering ourselves together on a regular basis. Because as we come together on the first day of the week to observe this memorial, we're here together. We have the opportunity to encourage one another. And God recognizes, I think, that we need to be with other people. I suspect that most of you saw the movie that was out several years ago with Tom Hanks started in called Castaway. Uh, he was in an airplane. His airplane went down in the ocean, and he was able to get a life raft, and, uh, and he was washed ashore on this desert island. And he was the only person, the absolute only person on that on that on that island. And it kept chronicling how he began to learn to adapt to the circumstances that he was under. But the fact of the matter is, toward the end of the movie, he learned that at one point. He was thinking about hanging himself because he was there all along. And he was there thinking that perhaps there was no way for him to ever get back to where he would be with anyone. I think that God is aware of the fact. He created us. He ought to know us well enough. I think that God understands that we need one another. We need to be encouraged by one another. We need to be uplifted by one another. And as we jointly participate in this memorial, we are reminded of the fact that we are indeed a part of God's wondrous family, brothers and sisters in Christ, and that we have a very important role in one another's life. We're told that the first century church were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. The only thing that's not mentioned there in that verse of Scripture as far as our worship unto God is singing of praises to God, but all the other acts of worship that we involve ourselves with 
as far as that is concerned, well, it doesn't talk about the contribution either, but it brings to our attention that that first century church that we are trying to pattern ourselves after was a people who came together on a regular basis to observe this memorial, to encourage one another, and to remember the great love that God has for us. He knows what he's doing. God doesn't do anything in that. He set this up. This was part of his eternal plan, his eternal purpose for us. So that we can come together, so that we can remember these things, so that we can be encouraged and assured in our relationship with the Father as we remember the death of His Son, Jesus Christ. Again, we want to offer the opportunity for anyone who needs to make the relationship with God sure. Make your relationship with God even as it should be. If you're not a Christian, we want you to become one. And we're ready here to assist you in becoming a Christian. If you're a child of God who has strayed away for some reason, we want to encourage you to come back and to walk faithfully with Him and to help us to walk faithfully with Him so that we can all, each and every one of us, enjoy that heavenly home that the Christ has gone and prepared for us. We would encourage you to respond. If you're to lead to, all together, stand and sing.